the two most important markets when we're talking about inequality are the labor market and the credit market. And the idea is that because we start at different positions, uh, that often influences where we end up. Not always, of course. Everybody can move up and down the sort of income distribution. People who are born poor can become you know, owners of successful firms. Um, but there's a lot of um, benefit to starting out as a wealthy individual, right? So here in this graph, we have our wealthy individuals in blue, and they can both become lenders and employers because they, are, they have the assets uh, with which to start firms or lend money. Um, then we have borrowers here. Now, if you are successful, you can borrow, you can become uh, an employer yourself. Um, whereas if you are unable to borrow uh, or you are unwilling to borrow, then you are more likely to become an employee. And of course, some employees will be employed and some will be unemployed. Um, and of course, being unemployed is going to mean that your income is very low, right? You're going to have to depend either on any savings, if you have any, or on the government. So let's think about sort of different markets and how they can uh, either increase or decrease inequality. So just a reminder of the Lorenz curve and the Gini coefficient. So the Lorenz curve shows the distribution of either income or wealth. We're going to look at income first here. And it lines up the uh, people based on income from poorest to richest going from left to right. And then the cumulative share of income going from uh, bottom to top. So it was always 100% and 100% in the top right corner and 0%, 0% in the bottom left corner. We have a 45 degree line going from the bottom left to the top right that represents complete equality if everybody has the same. But as we know, not everybody does have the same and so we can measure the Gini coefficient as the area uh, between the 45 degree line and the Lorentz curve divided by the entire triangle under the 45 degree line. And so what we're going to talk about is uh, different institutions, different endowments, uh, different technologies, different um, levels of education, and how that can affect uh, inequality. So here we're looking at uh, the effect of uh, making it easier to fire workers. And so these are all just examples, right? These are not based on real data, um, but they are based on... Um, the idea that uh, if you know if people are can be fired more easily, then they have uh, fewer rights and they might end up uh, being more unemployed. So here we have an initial Gini coefficient of 0 0.36. We have 10% uh, of the people are unemployed, right? So they have no income in this model, right? They would probably have some disposable income um, from the government in, in real life. And then we have workers, and workers are all earning the same, so we have a straight line here, and they go from 10% to 90%. Uh, and then 10% are owners, and they're getting, they all have the same income as each other, but a much steeper income. And so the initial Gini coefficient in this example is 0.36, which is the shaded area divided by the entire triangle under the 45 degree line. Now, if we make it uh, easier to fire workers, then the unemployment rate won't necessarily change, right? It won't necessarily go up, but it means that wages are likely to fall. And so in this case, wages fall from 60% of income to 48% of income, meaning that owners get 52% of income instead of 40%. And that increases the Gini coefficient, in this case, from 0.36 to 0.47. And, and this has been a big debate in economics about how easy should it be to hire and fire workers. Uh, and of course, if you just focus on firing workers, if it's really hard to fire workers, then firms will be a little nervous about hiring them in the first place. Uh, on the other hand, if workers don't have any rights and can be fired very easily, um, then they may face uh, lower wages. Right? And that's one of the powers that unions have is to make it more difficult to uh, fire workers um, and uh, increase uh, the overall wage share. Um, that's been one of the differences between the United States where it is easier to fire workers. Uh, most employees are called at-will employees and they can be fired basically for any reason. Um, whereas countries in Europe, it's generally harder to fire workers. And so 
Uh, that may be one of the reasons that uh, wages have not grown very quickly in the United States uh, over the last 40 years. So here's another example. We're going to look at education. And so we start off in the same place. So 10% are unemployed, uh, 90 the next 80% are working, they get 60% of income, and then the last 10% are owners, and they get 40% of income. So what happens if the workers become more educated? Well, that means their productivity is going to increase, and that means that their wage should increase as well. And so in this case, uh, the unemployment rate falls. We can think of you know, moving up the wage curve as productivity uh, and the profit curve shift up, and because they are more productive, they get a higher share of income. So now the unemployment rate falls to 5%. Uh, workers now get 73 and 3 quarters uh, of the income, and owners get the remaining 26 and a quarter percent of income. And so this is definitely one thing that has happened, and we definitely see that um, more educated workers uh, around the world, but especially in the United States, get paid more. So college educated workers get paid. 60 to 80 percent more than high school uh, educated workers. Another possibility is the immediate effect of labor saving technology. So we talked about this um, in more detail in chapter 15 and we said you know labor saving technology while it's generally good for workers in the long run might lead to uh, higher unemployment and lower wages in the short term and can definitely have a negative impact on some workers. And so if that's the case, if we get this increase in unemployment due to the labor-saving technology, here the unemployment rate increases from 10% to 20%, wages go down, so we have a flatter wage curve, um, and the owners who have implemented this labor-saving technology now get a larger share of income and inequality increases. And so this is definitely, I feel like, where we are right now. Um, and people are really nervous about introducing the introduction of labor-saving technology and what it's going to do to inequality, what it's going to do to the unemployment rate. And it still remains to be seen whether or not that's going to uh, have the positive effects that it always has had in the past or whether we're at a different type of turning point um, for the future. So the last one we want to look at is um, when borrowers are excluded from the credit market. And so here we have, um, don't worry about the, the I and the row, we're not worrying too much about that, but here nobody is excluded um, and everybody can borrow. If we get a group that are excluded uh, and can't borrow, then they get less income and more income goes to the lenders and inequality increases. Um, this has been important in the United States, but it's true around the world where there's often a group that doesn't have access to the same credit markets, the same education, the same uh, employment opportunities, and that can increase uh, inequality substantially. We're going to talk about that uh, later on in the chapter of when there's a group um, like African Americans in the United States uh, or different castes in India or different uh, ethnic groups minority groups in China that don't have the same uh, access to be successful um, as other groups. 